This is the video for D2.1 on cell and nuclear division, and this is a higher level topic on control of cell division. We're going to talk about several examples of cell proliferation, which is a rapid increase in the number of cells. And there are a few reasons um, why cell proliferation might take place. One of which being growth. Multicellular organisms like you and I grow larger by adding more cells. If you've already investigated the concept of surface area to volume ratio, then you know why, and if not, don't worry, you will. Um, but it's important to understand that our cells don't just grow in size, we add on more cells. And that's very easily seen here in this animal embryo, where we start out as one cell, that zygote, that fertilized egg, and we grow by adding and adding and adding cells via mitosis. In plants, this is going to happen in a region called their meristem, and we'll focus specifically on apical meristems. Apical meristems occur at the shoot, that's the top of the plant, and at the root, the very bottom. So apical meristems are going to be zones where there is a lot of cell division, high rates of mitosis. And if we're having a lot of mitosis, that means a lot of growth. So if it's happening at the shoot, the plant is growing taller. If it's happening at the root, the root is extending downwards. And one of the things that I highly suggest that you do is take a look at a root tip underneath of a microscope. Onion cells or onion plants tend to work really well here. And you'll notice that there are a lot of cells undergoing my, uh, mitosis in this apical meristem compared to other parts of that plant. The second reason for cell proliferation is cell replacement. Um, a lot of our cells have a definitive lifespan and some of them can be relatively short, like a matter of days. No matter what their lifespan is, if they have a pre-programmed lifespan or a cell death, then we're going to need to have a process for replacing them. A great example here is skin cells. So on the very outer layer of our skin, these are actually not living cells. They are dead cells. New cells are produced way down here in the dermis, the very inner layer of our skin. These new, uh, brand new skin cells eventually push their way to the top. By the time they get here though, they've lived their entire life and then once they reach the surface here, they are dead cells. So that means I'm gonna continually need a new supply of skin cells um, being pushed towards the surface. And the third reason for cell proliferation is tissue repair. Repair is something that would follow an injury or a wound. So if I have a wound, um, that means that I've had some kind of cell death and all of those cells that are dead or destroyed are going to need to be replaced. And that means we're going to have to really kick up the rates of cell division of mitosis in order to replace those dead cells. Now this will happen faster in some areas versus others depending on how many cells can readily undergo mitosis. So our skin tends to heal quite quickly because we already have a lot of cells that are here available undergoing mitosis anyways. They just have to get a little bit faster. Things like bones might require a little bit more time. This video is all about control of the cell cycle, and here we're looking at a diagram representing a cell cycle. And so you'll notice it's separated into a couple of parts. We have a very long phase here called interphase. So interphase is where cells spend most of their life. It is the longest phase for any cell, and interphase itself is split up into three smaller phases. So we have the G1 phase, which is growth, Okay, and during this time, the cell is also just doing whatever it is that that cell is supposed to be doing. Transcription, translation, if it's a muscle cell, it's doing muscle things. If it's a mucus producing cell, it's doing mucus things. So that's all happening here in the G1 phase. In the S phase, S stands for synthesis, we're synthesizing DNA. This is when DNA replication is going to occur. And in the last bit of interphase, we have the G2 phase, which is preparation for mitosis. So we're making enzymes that we need, copying organelles, that kind of thing. 
All three of these are part of interphase, okay? So that's a very long phase. Um, some of you may have learned interphase as the resting phase. The cell is not resting. Um, the cell is doing lots of things. It's just not actively dividing, okay? So I just wanna clear that up. After interphase, um, then we would move into mitosis. You already probably know a lot about mitosis, or hopefully, and you know that that includes prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase, and then the separation of the cytoplasm happens here in cytokinesis. Once those cells have been separated, each of the daughter cells starts its own cycle again, and we're back in interphase. So let's take a look at a cell and I'm gonna focus in on the nucleus and inside the nucleus, if we're in interphase, all of the DNA is in that chromatin form, that like loosely organized DNA. Um, it's not condensed into chromosomes, that happens in prophase. And because it's kind of loose, it makes it possible to be transcribed and translated. Once those histones start to attach to each other, it hides a lot of that DNA, making transcription impossible, okay? So during interphase, in the G1 phase, this cell is going to grow. And so that means that we need to increase the size of the membrane. So the ER is going to be producing vesicles that fuse with the membrane to allow it to increase in size. We also need to increase the number of organelles. Okay, so if I think about the purpose of this, I'm, I need to have enough in here for two daughter cells. That means I need to make um, new organelles and some of those are gonna be manufactured by the cell itself. So like the ribosomes, those are made by the nucleolus and I'm just gonna make a bunch more if I'm a cell that's about ready to undergo mitosis. Other organelles like the mitochondria and a chloroplast are self-replicating, okay? So they'll make their own copies, but at the end of the day, at the end of interphase, we need a high level of metabolism because there's a lot going on, okay? So we're growing, we're making new organelles, there's a high energy demand here, the cell is not resting, it's very busy. So at this point in our story, we've kind of gotten through interphase, right? And we're about ready, or we think we're ready to go into mitosis, but not so fast. Okay, in order to proceed from one part of the cell cycle to the next, you need to produce cyclins. Cyclins are proteins that control the cell cycle. There is a different cyclin produced at each checkpoint in the cell cycle. And that cyclin is going to bind with proteins Okay, um, that once that cyclin has bound with a protein, it allows the cell to progress into the next part of the cell cycle. So we're going to notice that cells produce cyclins at different phases, okay? So there's going to be one cyclin that's going to allow the cell to pass from G1 to S, okay? That's cyclin E here in this graph. Then we'll see the increase in concentration of a different cyclin in order to pass into G2 and a different cyclin in order to pass into mitosis. These cyclins act again as checkpoints, making sure that the cell has done all the things that it needs to do in order to progress into the next stage. So mitosis is good, but uncontrolled cell division producing way too many cells is bad. And cells have certain genes to ensure that mitosis is only happening when we actually need new cells. And we'll talk about two different genes that help with this. Um, one is called the proto-oncogenes and then also tumor suppressing genes. But before we get into this, let's just quickly define a tumor. A tumor is uncontrolled cell division division due to the mutation in one of these division controlling genes. So when one of these is not um, behaving correctly because of a mutation, um, we can get a tumor. So this mass of cells that is dividing and dividing out of control. These mutations can occur in one of three ways. One is just random. We know mutations are random. It just happens sometimes. Sometimes there are heritable mutations, okay? Like some of the um, genes for mm, breast cancer and the like. And then exposure to mutagens. So it could be like chemical, like certain toxins or radiation. These can cause mutations in either the proto-oncogenes or the tumor suppressing genes. 
So all these words are going to start to sound similar in just a minute. I want to be clear, proto-oncogenes, these are great. We like these. <laughs> these are genes that control the cell cycle, and they make sure that cells are only dividing, prolification is only happening when it's necessary. These can mutate, and when they mutate, they can turn into oncogenes. Oncogenes are bad. They promote uncontrolled cell division and are genetically dominant and very active. So they become a dominant allele, and they override the non-mutated proto-oncogene, and it leads to cell prolification that is out of control and the growth of a tumor. In addition to the proto-oncogenes, tumor suppressor genes um, are also genes that can prevent cell prolification um, and they correct errors due to DNA damage, so they are very important. If a mutation occurs, um, it's generally genetically recessive. So you would need two copies of that recessive mutated tumor suppressor gene in order to grow a huge tumor. This is why the number of tumor cells is relatively rare compared to the number of normal cells in our body because this is genetically recessive. Most of these tumors are harmless, so they're going to sit here. You may have um, seen that or heard that referred to as benign, okay? So just because they're there doesn't necessarily mean that they are causing problems, but they are the result of mutations in those tumor suppressing genes. Now, if you're not too distracted by my amazing drawing, let's talk about some different types of tumors. So a primary tumor is just a group of tumor cells that are sticking together. So let's say you have, or let's hope not, but let's say someone has a primary tumor in their lungs. As long as those tumor cells stay in the lungs, it remains a primary tumor. Sometimes, however, these tumor cells can break off and can travel via the bloodstream or the lymphatic system to other locations, okay? These secondary locations are called secondary tumors, okay? So here is the primary tumor and it traveled to a secondary location. So we have the primary and we have the secondary. What's really interesting about this is that these cells are already differentiated. So if these are lung cells, even if they travel to the brain, they are still lung cells. And if you were to open up this person's brain and remove this tumor, you would find lung cells in this person's brain. Kind of cool, but very scary. This process of spreading tumor cells is called metastasis. So these are things, tumors are things, okay? Metastasis is a process. That's represented here by this arrow. Malignant tumors are special types of tumors that are capable of metastasizing. Not all primary tumors become secondary tumors. Sometimes primary tumors stay where they're at. Only the malignant tumors are capable of metastasizing. So this is a way of describing some types of primary tumors. So what determines if something is malignant or not? A lot of things, but malignant tumors are more likely to occur, or I should just say these, they're more likely to occur in areas with high rates of cell division. So things like our ovaries or things like the thyroid, places where we are replacing cells a lot, the more we have to undergo cell division, the more likely it is that a mutation will take place and the more likely it is that that mutation will be in one of either the proto-oncogenes or the tumor suppressing genes. One of the ways to determine how aggressive a tumor is, is to calculate something called the mitotic index. So the mitotic index is actually a number. It will be between zero and one, and it's calculated by counting the total number of cells in a tissue sample. Okay, and then finding out how many of those cells are in mitosis. So that's prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. So basically the total number of cells minus interphase. Okay, so the total number of cells in mitosis divide, or sorry, I shouldn't say total, the number of cells in mitosis divided by the number of cells, and you'll get an answer between zero and one. 
the higher the mitotic index, the more cells that are undergoing mitosis, which means that there are faster rates of cell division. If you're looking at an area of growth, like let's say your bones versus my bones, your bones will likely have a higher mitotic index because you're adding a lot more cells. You're still growing, I am not. But if we're not looking at areas of growth, if we're looking at tumors, a higher mitotic index can indicate a more aggressive tumor. So for example, in this sample, I'm looking at these cells. Most of them are in interphase. Whereas in this sample, I'm seeing a lot more cells in various stages of mitosis. So something to think about here in calculating that mitotic index and one of the ways in which our cells control cell division. Again, theme D is continuity and change. Continuity being, can we get that DNA <laughs> passed along to the next generation in those daughter cells? Change being, well, what are some of the ways in which cell division can go awry? So please do keep an eye on that thematic approach.